will finish uh, this session with uh, our third speaker, who also will start from an airborne perspective, but I think his perspective goes uh, quite a bit further. He loves flying things. He loves slapping sensors on things that fly, but it's all kind of meaningless unless you can take all of that that's up in the sky down to the analyst. Um, and there's lots of frontiers with AI and ML uh, that uh, uh, get, give us new opportunities there. So I'd like to introduce from Georgia Tech Research Institute, the Chief of Space and Intelligence Programs, Eric Pruitt. Please give him a hand. Well, thank you, Chris, and thank you, USGIF. Over the past few years, the Georgia Tech Research Institute, along with the Naval Postgraduate School, have been working on some pretty cool things. One of those in particular is on behalf of the Office of Naval Research, and that's an autonomy payload that allows for collaborative flight autonomy for swarms of unmanned aerial vehicles. Now, they demonstrated this technology by launching dozens of UAVs, giving them only a geospatial box. And then they did something very simple. They sent a command and they said, we need six aircraft to converge over this target location at this specific time. The swarm of UAVs themselves chose which six aircraft would go. Those aircraft mapped their own flight trajectories and they converged over the target location just as they were asked to do at the given time. Now they followed this mission success with a dogfight. Now I say dogfight because we didn't actually weaponize the drones. Though we could have, because we're Georgia Tech and we could do that. But imagine if you will, they gave the drones a ability to sense essentially a kill box and shoot, uh, call them lasers, imaginary projectiles at the other aircraft. And so in this 10 on 10 dogfight, they were preloaded with different dogfight tactics and the drones again chose what the best tactics were to go head to head. So this was another mission success, which they then followed on and went to a bigger and better task, which was supporting the DARPA Service Academy Swarm Challenge. In this challenge, each of the service academies was given 30 drones, a mix of fixed wing and quad rotor aircraft, and they were able to upload and come up with their own dogfighting strategies. Now, once they had these loaded, they took off and they went head to head, they were scored. They were given tallies for number of kills. And as a Navy veteran, I'm happy to say that the US Naval Academy has achieved our ongoing commitment to beat Army and has won the challenge. Sorry, Brian. So as we say at Georgia Tech Research Institute, this is essentially problem solved. Now, it doesn't mean it's the end of the road for developing this technology. It just means we've gotten past art of the possible. And so now we need to look at what do we do with this technology? And my background is as an analyst in the intelligence community. I want to actually start to ask the question, so what? So what do, we, what do we do for the analyst? What do we do for the intelligence community guy that's out there trying to get better collection, higher quality collection, more near real time and specific answers to problems? I want to fly these groups of UAVs or pair those up with space or ground or sea surface or subsurface assets, and I want to perform ISR missions with them. So what we really need to do is get to collaborative sensing. And that's a little bit what I want to talk to you about today. So going back about 10 years in my past, we were using some of the tools you see on the screen here to do traditional types of analytic analysis across the intel community. Now this is just some of them and maybe you recognize them. But what really bothered me at the time is we were doing a lot of our analysis with this tool specifically. Not quite the definition of a collaborative analytic tool. So I got a call one day from a good friend of mine and he was working on a program and he said I think this is going to change analysis. I think this is really going to help us move past this stovepipe of knowledge and technique. And he said it's called Gemma. Now I don't want you to read all the text on the screen. I put this here so the guys with the guns and the big muscles don't come drag me off and say that's classified. So, um, so this information is out in the public forum. But what Gemma was essentially, or is, is essentially a canvas, he said. He says a canvas that we can put blocks on them, and we'll call these components, 
And each of these components does a specific intelligence task. And then analysts can wire these blocks together and they're going to press the little play button and things are going to turn green across the screen and on the other end is out pops an analytic result and a happy analyst, hopefully. And I said, that sounds really cool. And he says, but wait, there's more. He said, we're also going to make this collaborative. So when you build an analytic model, this is going to be shared and visible by all of the other analysts that use this. And I said, that sounds great. He says, but wait, there's more. He says, we're also going to allow you to put models within models so you can nest these things and build simple components, but at a high level, you'll have very transparent analytic workflows. And I said, sounds great. So we used this for several years, and it was highly successful. It's a great tool. But those nested models looked a little bit more like this, as my colleagues love to tell me about some of my models. And so it wasn't quite as transparent or maybe even as collaborative as we'd hoped because there was still a learning curve. People still had to dive into all this data. And then there was this other problem that was highlighted to me once when I had a phone call from a soldier out in Afghanistan. And he said, I've been using one of your models for weeks. It's been great. It's helping us win the fight. But today I went to run it and things turned red. It didn't work. So he tells me the name of the model and I haven't seen this model for years. I honestly hadn't touched the model in years and it was still doing great things. But what it highlighted was that the analysts were creating thousands upon thousands of models. And in this community of thousands of analysts, we actually were creating hundreds of thousands of models. But we weren't taking the time to go back and actually update those models. We weren't taking the time to make sure that every single system upgrade actually kept the models working. So again, it's a great tool, it's doing great things, but we needed a little bit of help. So as I was doing this work in my community, I got another call from a friend of mine, and he said, hey, we're starting up this thing down south of DC, and it's called the Advanced Campaign Cell. And what we'd like to do is bring all of these analysts from the multi-ant community, from each intel agency, together, and we're gonna solve really hard intelligence community challenges. We'd like to take those Gemma models you're making and capture those analytic techniques so that we can share those with the rest of the community. And I said, I'd love to help. And so we had some great mission successes. And one of those successes in particular spurred another phone call. Notice I'm keeping with the text here so I don't get drug off the stage. Um, so this is from NRO and they said, hey, this, we have this program called Sentient and what we'd like to do is promote some of these great techniques up to where they can actually help us do better collection. And so I said, love to help. So we did that also. And again, it worked. And to this day, I still see some of the original models that we put and promoted into Sentient providing great intel value. But you know, interestingly enough, I haven't talked to the Sentient guys myself about my models in three or four years. So we're back to this same challenge, refresh. And I'm not saying they're not keeping it up to date because I know they certainly are, but, but the work that I've done and the types of things I've learned since then have not gone back into this. So how do we get to the point where the analysts remain an active part of these great tools and systems that we've been putting in place to do better collection and to execute the mission better. We believe that to do that, we need to start seeing a little bit more human-machine collaboration. Now, I'm not gonna spend too much on talking about what that is. Dr. Hahn spoke about it earlier, a great example of that, and that's Google's AlphaGo system. Now, the AlphaGo system took one of the most complex human-played games in the world and it took a problem that people said that AI couldn't solve. Great, it can do Jeopardy, great, it can do checkers, great, it can do chess, but can it do this? And they figured out that the way to do it was through using the human players and having the machines learn from them, along with the traditional AI. But it's something else that Google has been doing for years and something that you do every day that I think is what's gonna change the Intel community. And it's this, Google search. You see, when you go to Google search, the machine watches you. The machine watches what you type, it watches how you type it, and then it solicits very implicit feedback unobtrusively to you to understand how well it's performing. So as it makes suggestions, as it offers search results, it's giving feedback to how well it's doing, and it can offer you better results next time. 
And so I imagine a world in the Intel community where we put this type of technology behind all of the processes within the intelligence cycle. We put it behind the tasking and requirements folks. We put it behind the oversight and compliant folks. We put it behind the analysts, the signal processors, the reporters, the decision makers. And we let the machine watch the types of techniques that they use to perform their job each and every day. And as it watches those techniques, it can offer suggestions, it can offer to do back-end enhancements, it can look for other data sources, and in general, help them to do a better job at the daily tasks that they're performing. So let's look a bit in the future now, and let me tie this back together. So I imagine a day not too long from now where an analyst is gonna come in to work, and she's gonna sit down at her desk, and there in front of her is going to be the most precise, high quality, and high volume amount of intelligence data that she's needed to solve her problem than she had seen before. And that's not gonna happen through magic. That's going to happen because sometime, maybe a week earlier, as the machine was watching her perform her daily tasks and do analysis in the tools that she's comfortable using and in the tools that she needs to get her mission done, it's going to have watched what were the best techniques. And when the machine offers suggestion, it's gonna note where things improved and which ones she accepted and which ones she rejected. And as it does that, it's also gonna look across at the other analysts and it's gonna look the people through the reporting chain. And it's gonna understand the value of how those techniques are affecting others. And it's gonna to start to combine those efforts into more focused techniques. And then it's gonna do something else. It's gonna to start to promote these up to the national level, to those sentients of the future. And it's gonna say, hey, the analysts are using this type of data and they need more of it because I can tell from what they're doing there's gaps or I can tell from what they're doing, if I could train just a little bit better in my machine learning with this type of data, I could offer a better solution. So what's gonna happen then is the sentient type tool is going to then use that to collect more data and more precise data, more focused data for what the analytic needs are. And as it sends that data back down through that chain, through the analysts, to the reporters, it's gonna get the feedback again, unobtrusively, and it's gonna note the quality of it. And as it starts to see how well that's happening, then it's gonna promote that data to another level. And this goes back to where I started at. It's gonna say, hey, you know, there's some great sensors out there in the tactical community that are really there on the ground. They're really there helping fight the fight. And it's gonna send this type of information, these techniques, these gaps, this understanding of the mission needs of the analyst and the reporter to answer the questions that decision makers are having every day. And on those platforms, on those unmanned area vehicles, on those space vehicles, on those ground, surface, and subsurface vehicles, you're going to have decision support systems, payloads, like the one that we have for the autonomous flight, which is about the size of a credit card and is getting smaller every day. And those systems are gonna receive updates of this type of information prior to flight, and maybe even in flight. And they're gonna be able to collaborate with each other without an operator in the loop. And they're gonna be able to go out, and in some cases, as we've helped the Office of Naval Research with, they're gonna be able to launch dozens of these things off the side of Navy ships. They're gonna fly into hostile territory and places where there's humanitarian needs. And they're gonna go out and perform a mission to a level we've never seen. They're going to bring back data to the analyst, to the reporter, to the national and tactical decision maker that's of a higher quality, it's of a better timeliness, it's had pre-processing because it understands what the analyst is gonna do with it when, it when they receive it. So they'll be able to pre-process some of this stuff. And it's going to help us win the intelligence challenges and battles of the future. And that's the type of research that me and my colleagues are heading towards now. That's how we're going to make use of this great technology of autonomous vehicles and collaborative mission execution. We hope that you will follow us on this journey and be a part of it. And I thank you for your time today. And if you want to talk more, please catch me at the booth. Thank you.